final recording on um, Irving Goffman's uh, book, Asylums, essays on the situation of mental patients uh, and, and other inmates. So it's his study of, of mid-20th century uh, total institutions. Uh, the chapter that we're going to be focusing on in this lecture is The Underlife of a Public Institution, Study of Ways of Making Out in a Mental Hospital. It's the longest chapter. Um, it, it's almost a novella. Uh, or <laughs> um, th That chapter is as long as Encounters on its own. Um, and I'm going to leave off the final chapter of the book, The Medical Model and Mental Hospitalization, some notes on the vicissitudes of the tinkering trades. It's kind of a silly essay where Goffman um, basically argues that, you know, people who wind up in a mental institution or in uh, a prison are essentially broken and um, are turned over to a service professional of some kind who will then uh, repair them and the, you know, tinker with them a bit. Um, I, I find this essay um, almost unusable. So we'll just, it, again, it's his sort of sometimes snotty, um, you know, sometimes um, aggrieved, um, you know, sometimes morally outraged, um, and sometimes just sort of silly a criticism of primarily psychoanalytic uh, psychiatry. I think it misses the mark for a bunch of reasons. One of which is, as he says on uh, the footnote, which I did finally locate again, um, on page uh, 312, it's the footnote at the bottom where he says of approximately 7,000 patients in, in St. Elizabeth's Hospital, I calculated at the time of the study that only about 100 received some kind of individual psychotherapy in any way that's in a year. So only, you know, one in 70 in a year received um, any personal uh, uh, psychotherapy. So I think that the failure of these institutions to uh, affect a cure in patients um, is not due to the failure of the treatment itself. I think it's due to the um, mental uh, hospital um, focusing on um, managing a, a warehouse population much more than uh, focusing upon curing or treating or providing therapy for those inside. Um, so it's a matter of resources. It's a matter of expenditure, a matter of priority. And, um, you know, the same with prisons, that the high recidivism rate of those who come in and out of prisons in the United States isn't really a condemnation of either the inmates or the possibility for reform. It has to do with institutional prerogatives and where uh, the emphasis is placed. I think, as I mentioned in the last uh, uh, video, you know, it's been odd. From the time that Goffman wrote uh, this book in 1960 or so till now, uh, we've had a massive decarceration movement, at least in the field of psychiatry and, and, and mental health, so that we really lack um, large-scale public um, 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 inpatient uh, mental health facilities um, and we basically put uh, mentally ill people out onto the streets and into prison. And we have seen that prison populations have, uh, I think they peaked in 2009 in America. Uh, some of that population was warehoused in private for-profit prisons, which is another issue and another problem. The United States continues to incarcerate either the largest percentage of our population or one of the largest percentage of populations in, in, in the developed world. Um, and we have a higher percentage of our population incarcerated, or at least in the criminal justice system, than uh, many non-developed countries. Um, and, you know, um, we really are coming at the end of about a 30 or 40 year increase in prison incarceration um, that has paralleled the decrease in mental health um, um, you know, inpatient treatment. So, um, you know, we're, we're in an odd position. In, in general, um, I think Goffman and Foucault and, um, you know, those who look at the innards of concentration camps and, and slave quarters and so on, um, provide us with a pretty harrowing picture of what a total institution can be. But at the, at, at the same time, um, you know, other countries, other systems, um, have created more therapeutic uh, facilities, and um, you know we probably could learn a lot. So I think that the critique of total institutions is valid. It's important. I really want students thinking about the capacity for 
bureaucratically organized, technologically sophisticated, um, um, you know, organizations to grab hold of people, to mortify people, to strip them down, to break them down, and then to rebuild them in organizationally prescribed ways. I want you thinking about that. I want you thinking about what a contemporary state-of-the-art prison camp would look like or what a contemporary state-of-the-art uh, concentration camp might look like. Um, I think we need to be asking these kinds of questions um, about what would be possible. So I think, you know, uh, in, in many ways, you know, when I was a kid growing up, like there was this silly program called Hogan's Heroes that was like a television program for children, uh, right? At the innards of a, Jerby, a German POW camp, right? And, you know, the inmates had this elaborate system worked out, all kinds of an underlife, right? And, um, and again, it was a children's program on in the afternoon when the kids came home from school. Um, but, but, you know, we were still living in, you know, the 70s when I was a kid, um, you know, in the shadow of World War II. Uh, we're farther away from, uh, um, you know, the end of the Holocaust. Um, it, my childhood is farther away from today than the Holocaust was from my childhood. So, I mean, a lot of water is under the bridge. But um, we've seen a rise of authoritarianism in our time. Um, the United States during the last um, administration had uh, very famously and very publicly incarcerated children uh, and families um, at the southern border in um, immigration uh, uh, camps and, um, you know, separated children, all these kinds of things. So um, the possibilities for um, a truly horrific um, um, total institution um, structure um, uh, re-emerging. Um, it's, it's a non-zero chance that it could come back. So, um, so anyway, I want people thinking about totalitarianism, authoritarianism, and the use of total institutions, both to train like soldiers and prison guards and police and right the, the 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 training of people often takes place in total institutions in the warehousing of dangerous or um you know uh, um undesirable populations um for strategic purposes in these camps is important too okay and then by the time we get to Giorgio Gombin's work you know he believes really that the the concentration camp is essentially the primary structure of our time and that um in that you know the percentage of population is going to be placed inside of these spaces spaces where people lack civil rights uh, will probably just uh, increase over time okay so um so let's get back to to goffman then and what goffman uh um, has so let's just look a little bit at my drawing um um in my book so um goffman's book is primarily about what happens to people who are ripped out of civil society um, who are forced to mortify the civil self, kill off the civil self, get stripped to nudity, and then get rebuilt uh, by a, uh, an institution, um, a total institution, an asylum of some kind. He argues that the formal side of the institution, uh, that's all about rules and so on and more about that in just a second, is what we, is what like administrators and those who create these institutions think is happening to patients, that they're being reconstructed on official lines. Um, and so on. But what he finds when you actually get inside of a total institution and treat it as a society, you know, basically treat the inmates as an anthropological tribe and try to look at what they do, what he finds is that the informal social life that the inmates uh, create with each other, much of which it, uh, occurs outside of the radar or at least outside of the official um, social control of the staff, um, is actually more important to them. It certainly is the place where something like a continuation of civil society can occur. And in the aftermath, uh, when a patient becomes an ex-patient and when they are released back out into uh, civil society, um, you know, their de the degree to which they're able to succeed and to be able to um, quickly um, use the muscles of civil society, of self-determination, of trust, social trust, of, of, uh, and, and so on, of creativity and, and entrepreneurship and those other kinds of things, the degree to which they're able to do that often depends upon the informal underlife of a total institution rather than its formal official structure. So it's not the staff 
and the official treatment that actually probably cures people or makes them fit for return uh, to civil society. Instead, it's the um, underlife, the unofficial illicit activity that takes place uh, that probably best prepares people for life on the outside again. Okay. All right. So, uh, so again, the big problem about uh, total institutions, they were everywhere in the 1960s. They've tended to decline, except in the penal system in America. Um, and um, we really should ask ourselves questions again about, about what, the, what camps are, concentration camps, uh, warehousing camps, migrant camps, um, work camps, um, in these structures that have uh, a total institution logic to them, um, what they're going to be like. So again, I've been reading a lot. Um, uh, um, Henry Dick's book, uh, License Mass Murder, recommend it to anyone. Um, and again, I've been looking at, um, at Bishop's book. Um, Edward Bishop's book from, what is it, 2016 now, 2017, 2014. God, is that old? Um, the Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery in the Making of American Cap Capitalism, Edward Baptist. It's um, a good book of, of, uh, of, uh, of sort of American economic history. And, you know, he clearly um, um, depicts at least... Um, some regional variations of American slavery, chattel and, and race slavery, as having the structure of a total institution, right? So, um, so slavery structures the total institution, concentration camps, migrant camps, um, prisoners and actual prisons, um, and, and so on. So, so again, Goffman's writing about asylums, which have all but disappeared, but the analysis, um, you know, can easily be, again, um, extended to these other total institutions that continue to exist and that are troubling uh, uh, us in our time. Okay, so I think what we should do, I, I threw my book down, I probably shouldn't, but we should, let, let's just jump inside of, um, of the essay on the underlife of a total institution. So let me do it as a skeleton key. I won't walk through every point. You know, again, just to remind you, Goffman's a very good writer. The illustrations and examples that he uses are, are, are powerful, um, interesting, always interesting. And, and readable. So, uh, so I really do encourage you to read the, the book. This is not a substitute for reading the book. It's just merely a skeleton key to help you get through it in sort of an efficient way. Okay, so, uh, so this essay opens page 188 or so, 189, um, with um, really the distinction between primary adjustment and secondary adjustment. So um, again, the idea is, is that a, an inmate comes into the institution, is stripped um, of the civil self, it is mortified, it dies away, and then um, they make a primary adjustment to the organization by following, um, you know, um, um, official, yeah, when you pursue official ends for official reasons and you accept both the, um, the institution's basic um, um, charge or a goal, um, you know, to reform or to um, heal, and then you also accept the definition of self uh, that comes to you as you're handed the inmate role in the institution. In fact, you, in many ways, appear at least to embrace the role of inmate. And as Goffman tells us, in many ways, you're unable to escape um, uh, that implication, that you are an inmate. You have no way to escape it, right? You cannot get away from the self-implications of being a, a prisoner, of being uh, a, a patient in a mental health in, um, hospital, of being a... Um, you know, um, a migrant held in a camp somewhere, of being a refugee held in a camp, right? You can't get around um, these, uh, uh, these, these implied things. You know, I, I taught in Kansas City. I used to take my students to City Union Mission uh, in downtown Kansas City, um, a religiously run homeless shelter for men that was absolutely run uh, along a prison model, very much a total institution, right? So again, you're a homeless man needing to get soup from a, um, in a bed from a homeless shelter, right? So you're there, you really have little choice, and, um, and you're basically forced to kind of embrace the role of inmate in order to get access, um, you know, to prevent something worse from happening to you, becoming intransigent or something. All right, so the primary adjustment then that the, the person stripped of the civil self makes is to the official, um, you know, protocols, to the official staff, to the official... Um, 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 you know, um, um, 
uh, order of, of the institution. So it's formal, official, authorized, right? Um, you follow an officially written, prescribed uh, set of procedures. Uh, you're, you're consciously acknowledged to self and others as a member, uh, as an inmate to someone who's inside and probably possesses at least uh, the, the bare qualities necessary to be an inmate. Um, you often are not... Um, yeah, often um, not officially uh, your treatment or goals. Okay, I'm not sure what that is exactly. Not officially... Okay. Treatment goals. Okay, I'm not even sure what that means. Sorry about that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That you're not that <laughs> that despite being an inmate, uh, as Goffman tells us, the official structure and the organizational operation of a total institution is rarely uh, actually the straight on pursuit of its goals or ends or treatment or um, or reform. That isn't it. That it's actually organized around the privilege system and around the ward system he's going to talk about in the institution. So even if you are an inmate, even if you do make a primary adjustment to the organization, it doesn't mean that you believe the organization is going to cure you or that it's going to reform you. Instead, you are going to be oriented to the way that the organization is managed by the staff, which is in terms of privileges, right? Credits and discredits, where you can be promoted up into wards with higher uh, levels of privileges and comforts or be demoted back into those with less, right? And so you're not oriented again to like the inner psychological working of, uh, of therapeutics or into reform or something. Instead, you're completely oriented to, uh, you know, like a grading system. Okay, so that's the primary adjust adjustment. But Goffman tells us that when you actually go into a total institution and study it, you recognize that there are many secondary adjustments, uh, the unofficial side that the uh, patient or the inmate makes. Um, 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 makes. So, um, so these are uh, often these are secondary gains that are widely used by... Um, by uh, um, inmates, but they're not just secondary gains on an individual basis. What he calls secondary adjustments are sort of institutionalized, socially patterned, collective means to, um, as he says, these are means to either, uh, these are either unauthorized means, unauthorized, and authorized ends, or both. And it's really interesting how many of his secondary adjustments are actually authorized means that are simply deployed for unauthorized ends. But by engaging in, in this illicit activity, this unauthorized activity, you know, using facilities in a way that you're not supposed to use it or using time in a way or using other people in a way you're not supposed to, um, that it actually expresses distance, right? It's, an, it's, it's a role distance in Goffman's terms um, in which you're placing yourself um, um, away from the full self-implication and existential implication of embracing the role of inmate, right? So you're you're perverting to agree at least, or subverting, probably a better term, subverting um, the role of inmate and the order of um, inside of the institution. So this is the informal, the unofficial, the unauthorized. So I, as I said last time, when you are primary adjusted to a total institution, you're, or you're primarily oriented to the staff, and your case number is what really uh, becomes your primary identification. That's the official record of your promotion and demotion, determines your um, quality of life inside and determines whether you're getting out. But the informal side, you're primarily oriented towards other inmates, right? And you probably are going to be identified with a nickname. Even if your old name outside is used, um, it's going to have the quality of a nickname, right? That your full identity won't carry forward with your name. It'll be some uh, shortened version of it um, or some, you know, uh, again, kind of a, uh, it's a moniker that, that may capture part of your physical characteristics or something else, but but it's a nickname. So you lose your civil self, your civil title. No one's going to call you Mrs. Smith or something like that or Dr. X. Instead, you're going to be uh, have a nickname and a case number. Okay. All right. So again, these are not in what Goffman is interested in isn't individual adjustments, but social adjustments. So collective practices, right? Socially patterned collective practices. Okay. 
And then he argues that if the primary adjustment and the inmate role is something that is consciously acknowledged by the organization, the, the secondary adjustments, the relations that a patient has to other patients in this kind of illicit way is something that is officially unconscious. It isn't something that's officially recognized by the organization. And it is, um, it's even to use other terms, closeted, it, it's, it's, it's furtive, right? It's hidden in some way. Okay, so then he divides up secondary adjustments, these, these practices where you get a secondary gain by using unauthorized means to achieve unauthorized ends or, or some part of that, uh, that there's two types. There are disruptive secondary adjustments, this is page 199, and then what he calls contained secondary adjustments. So disruptive secondary adjustments um, are either whether they're intentional or unintentional, they have a tendency to rupture the organization, rupture the world, rupture, rupture the activity system, and even rupture the, identif the identification of the role of the inmate, right? And because of that, they tend to face really strong social control, really strong sanction, and aren't tolerated. So secondary adjustments that are disruptive are probably handled by the social control system that the staff has officially um, been authorized to use, okay? So it tends to die out and go away. So the underlife of a total institution, the focus of this chapter, is almost entirely con uh, composed of the sum total of contained secondary adjustments. So what are those? Well, those are, again, whether intentional or unintentional, these are uh, unauthorized practices that augment the primary adjustments, right? That help sustain the organization and its world, that fill in the official primary rules to help keep the world of the inmates going, uh, right, in a kind of secondary, uh, unofficial way. So when I teach organizations, I often talk about the difficulties that even the most uh, intelligent managers or organizational designers face. That you, when, when, when you're having a, uh, a population that's actually incarcerated, you have to provide for every single one of the needs. And many of those needs are difficult to anticipate and are hard to coordinate across the, uh, a diverse population. Hence... Um, the, the, the formal rules are either a rough sketch of the actual practices inside or are um, actually contradictory to the kind of practices that would need to be performed in order for people to make out, live, um, maintain a minimum standard of, of humanity, right? That the formal rules often don't do it. So then you get these informal, unauthorized practices that fill in. So what Goffman says is management often is blind to these officially, but kind of knows that they go on. They turn a blind eye to them. So contained secondary adjustment are inmate invented, inmate perfected, inmate managed, inmate coordinated, inmate controlled, unauthorized, unofficial practices that nevertheless are absolutely crucial to the total institution uh, to keep it operating. In other words, if you would eliminate contained secondary adjustments from a total institution, it would collapse, okay? Because then you'd have to have all these make-do uh, arrangements that are disruptive and the whole thing would shut down. So contained secondary adjustments are important to the organization to keep it going. And what Goffman is going to tell us, contained secondary adjustments help preserve the sense of self because you distance yourself from the inmate rule and preserve the civil self by basically uh, operating inside of a voluntary association in a society, okay? So it's a structural analysis he pre that he promotes here where you examine the full formal, informal, uh, that when you examine an institution in both its formal and informal aspects, actually, again, study it like an Aboriginal tribe, um, you chart the reality of the organization and the personas that are within it. What you find is that, again, these unofficial, unauthorized practices keep the thing going, right? Um, it's like an old car that's kept running with all kinds of, you know, electrician's tape and bailing wire and other things. And if you remove those, those um, user-added uh, patches, the thing would fall apart. Well, that's a total institution. If you remove the, uh, the patchwork of, of secondary adjustments that the inmates use to sustain a life, the thing would fall apart. Okay. And if you took that away, the patients would have no ability to preserve uh, or protect their soul and that they, the, more, the civil self would truly die 
and um, they would have a hard time recovering and being capable of assuming civil uh, roles on the outside when released. Okay, so page 201, secondary adjustments. Um, uh, he, he argues are most dense at the top and the bottom of organizations. Middle management, um, driven kind of like by Protestant ethic or a pietist ethic or something, um, aiming at its own promotion and so on, uh, tend to have very little scope and very little sort of incentive uh, for distancing from the role that they play, and hence um, aren't going to engage in a lot of secondary adjustments. But at the bottom, you know, laborers, workers uh, in, in an organization rather than management, students rather than professors, uh, and then those at the very top who have access to a whole bunch of resources, you know, um, are, are the most likely to uh, commit uh, secondary adjustments, or at least not commit, but to have access to them to grow them. Page 203, the inc oh yeah, that the greater the percentage of life that's lived inside of, a, uh, of an organization, the greater the underlife will be, right? That, 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 that the more an organization becomes total, um, that means the more needs are likely to be unplanned and unmet, the more that embracing that, that total institution's um, definition of self uh, leaves part of the self, un, un, um, I guess, unfed. And so uh, there's going to be an increased incentive to push back. So the more an institution becomes total, the more the inmates in it are going to want to distance themselves from it and are going to need to have um, secondary adjustments to survive and to make do. So it's the inmates in a total institution, the people that are there 24-7, are much more likely to develop secondary adjustments and to need them than the staff who only works eight-hour days and goes home. Okay. Um, so the, again, the page 206 organization is officially blind to the underlife. It doesn't exist. Um, yeah. And then again, like on page 176, uh, footnote 176 on page 312, where only one in 70 patients received official care or having treatment, uh, the ward system and the privilege system is actually what's going on inside of the organization and that has very little to do with treating and, 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 and so on. And so then there's this huge need since the patients aren't being treated, they're simply being managed and warehoused, then there's this massive need to recover parts of the civil self um, by generating something like a civil society inside of the institution, which is what the underlife is. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, so... Um, Okay, so then the, the hospital underlife. Um, page 201, he starts outlining these things. Uh, 201 seems wrong, but he talks about make dues. Um, so that's a, um, so yeah, so in the mental hospital, uh, a make do is when you use something, some resource that's available inside that you're authorized to have, but you're turning it to unauthorized ends. So, you know, taking, you know, making knives out of, um, you know, implements that are, that are uh, ready to hand, those kinds of things. Page 210, he talks about working the system. Again, using authorized means, you're allowed to uh, engage in certain activities at certain times, certain practices, but you're turning those to unauthorized ends. I'm not going to go through these examples, which are excellent, but I won't, I won't talk about them uh, in detail here. Uh, page 215, collective working the system. This is where you move above just an individual making use of a practice where you really begin getting a division of labor and coordination across different inmates. Um, and again, using authorized means to achieve unauthorized ends. You know, he, he talks about, um, you know, some of these substitute ends include things like trying to, to, to pass, you know, like it's one of the pleasures of being able to pass as not an inmate, but a staff member or, or, or someone who's just visiting. And so getting a way to be able to do that, to get a temporary relief from the self implications of being an inmate is something that people uh, will, will do trying to pass. So anyway, there's all kinds of substitute ends here, but you're making use of resources, of practices, of collective practices in order to get um, your needs met. Um, yeah, then he writes about workable assignments um, and, and how those operate. Uh, so workable assignments are like getting a job assignment that allows you, again, to pursue unofficial ends by, you know, um, you know getting to... Um, you know, hang out in the library where you get a lot of time uh, to sit in a chair and relax, that kind of thing. Okay, so we have what? One, two, three, four, five, six um, uh, of the ends that are pursued um, um, in these, um, um, in the, in, 
inside by, by, by engaging in these practices, these secondary adjustments. So, um, yeah, so you get substitute ends, you get, uh, you get incidental side benefits, again, like, uh, like people who go to gym and volunteer to gym or sign up to go to a gym, not to work out, so that they can take a nap on the nice mats that are in there uh, for working out. So you're substituting the official end for a side benefit of your own. You can uh, go to something like group therapy or engage in some other practice, dance therapy even, uh, not to therapeutically adjust your mind, but rather to engage in romantic and, and sexual um, entanglements. Uh, you can engage in a practice or an activity to reduce the staff surveillance that you drop out of view, get freedom from surveillance. Um, you can find opportunities to earn extra points. And so people will engage in activity, not because they want to, but because they get the external reward of, of advancement into a higher ward or something like that. And then you seek out opportunities to have contact with those who have the power to release you. All right. So you're trying to get around staff and spend as much time as your day as possible with the staff, not at, under their surveillance as an inmate, but a staff uh, member who's a co-worker, uh, you know, where like you're an assistant to a staff member, that kind of thing. So these are all substitute ends or substitute means uh, that constitute some of the underlife. Page 227, he starts writing about places and the way that the territories of a total institution get redeployed. Um, so he talks about there are spaces that are off limits, out of bounds, that can be uh, taken over by, uh, by inmates. Um, there are, are times when inmates are allowed to be in a given surveillance space, but they can find ways to, again, turn that space to their own ends. But he writes especially about things he calls free spaces. These are places that are away from uh, surveillance uh, of the staff. And so they become a backstage location, um, you know, yeah, where you where you don't have to have all of your actions loop back upon you when you can engage in inmate to inmate cultural contact without having uh, the staff involved or the staff um, uh, reporting you and so on. So these are places, as Goffman says, with a lot of relaxation and you where you can be self-determined. So this is sort of uh, uh, what life on the outside was life before you became an inmate was you were able to find spaces where you weren't being surveyed and watched and controlled and uh, where you could relax, right? And so these are, again, our little places where the soul can come back or can at least be um, exercised. The muscles of civil society can be exercised in these spaces. Um, some wards are good because when you get promoted, you get access to more free space. Um, so, so that's one of the incentives. So one of the incentives for getting promoted to a higher ward isn't just because of the official um, uh, advantages, but because of these illicit, uh, unauthorized advantages as well. And in fact, you might not care about getting promoted up into a better ward if it weren't for the existence of, of these uh, free spaces and secondary adjustments. Okay, so watching other people enjoy free spaces is a pleasurable activity for those who don't have access to them. So he claims, again, this is a social practice that isn't just those who are in the spaces that benefit, but even those who don't have access to them, but can nevertheless, you know, empathetically or sympathetically enjoy them uh, by watching others do it. So the more unesthetic the space or the activity, the freer it tended to be. So people who volunteered for uh, particularly unpleasant tasks often found themselves rewarded with freedom from surveillance. Okay, so this is all about the underlife, where something that's a practice or a location or a resource that has a normal official purpose gets redeployed by the inmates um, uh, for another reason. And inmates tell other inmates how to work this, how to do this, how to become wise to these opportunities. Okay, page 243 writes about group territories. These are places that are owned by specific groups or subgroups of of inmates often um, with the kind of collaboration of staff members, right, who will, are willing to grant sort of spatial ownership uh, to a specific subset of inmates. Page 243, he writes about personal territories, um, which are collectively uh, organized, collectively explained, right? You become wise to these things as you're in, uh, but they're nevertheless places for personal privacy and a place where you're able to locate and store uh, uh, private goods, that kind of thing as we go here, okay? So personal territories are then our refuge sites, places where you can escape surveillance and get some privacy. Um, you know, a private sleeping room is the ideal, but you don't always have access to that. 
So habitually occupied public spaces often get divided up into private spaces and private territories on a first come first serve basis or on the strongest rules basis, as he says. There's minimal uh, personal territories. If you don't have access to anything else, patients will sometimes take a blanket and put a blanket over their head, basically creating a tent, and that that gives them something like um, private space and uh, just space away from the other inmates, space away from the staff. Um, so it's it's like a little mental refuge or a mental vacation, and that this activity of putting a blanket over your head and sitting in the middle of a crowded room is often read as a symptom of a psychic disorder. And this is something Goffman keeps emphasizing. This isn't a sign of a disorder. It's something a normal person who's used to having privacy in civil society would do if they were placed in um, uh, um, a common room with a bunch of other inmates where you don't have any privacy. So the healthiest person might do this, just cover themselves with a blanket just so that they, they can get some of the refuge that they normally have available to them in civil society, right? So it's not a symptom of a disorder. It's an adjustment, a secondary adjustment to life inside of the uh, institution. So it's socially generated behavior rather than structurally determined behavior rather than a symptom of a psychic disorder. Okay, um, the greater the personal, uh, uh, yeah, uh, high levels of personal territories are often uh, granted to those who have access uh, to staff jobs. So if you're working with the staff, you often have access to their staff space, which gives you freedom from surveillance and freedom from access uh, or the immediate contact with other patients. In other words, you get personal space by having access to the staff space. So taking a job, again, where you're working as an assistant for a staff person has all kinds of perks. Page 248, uh, facilities get redeployed. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, so possessions and the storage of possessions. So individuals in civil society, uh, we have an identity kit, we have clothing, we have all kinds of things that are like little, um, in Harry Potter terms, little um, horcruxes where we store our soul or our identity. We need a place to put those, and that's what a stash is. And he talks about different kinds of stashes. There are personal portable stashes. So uh, Herman Melville's book about um, working in, a, in the merchant marine in the 19th century, White Jacket, the name of the jacket, the name of the book, is this jacket that's sewn with all kinds of little pockets inside of it so that the marine um, uh, or the sailor is able to have personal property uh, stored at, you know, uh, and maintain coins uh, and other things that are valuable to them stored on their person. So the coat becomes like a, a walking storage closet, a personal portable stash. There are fixed stashes that are located all over um, the institution in places that the staff may not know about, uh, but other inmates might. And again, so these are often socially coordinated, socially passed on, and socially uh, uh, trusted, uh, right, and, and, and mutual that there's trust involved here. Page 254, uh, there's a transportation system that often emerges in an institution. As soon as you know that things matter and that other people matter, you need a transportation system to smuggle things around. So you circulate bodies, you circulate things, exchange objects, you circulate messages. Uh, he talks about like completing a phone call in the 1960s was a big deal if you could pull this off, to have two inmates each get a hold of a phone at the same time and to be able to pull off a phone call or get somebody who normally wouldn't have access to a phone into one where they're able to make a phone call outside. High achievement. Okay, so you can see here that, 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 that these are all civil society uh, possession, civil society uh, spaces that are absent inside the institution and that the inmates need if they're going to preserve the civil self. And so then you get a social organization among the inmates to provide these things. So page 262, you get a social structure, high levels of trust and coordination that are necessary for a division of labor to develop and for these complex forms of action uh, to be pulled off. So how do you get people to do it? So on the outside, you pay people or you do it favor exchanges. Well, you can't really pay people directly easily within an institution. So how do you get people to do it? Page 263, direct coercion, physical threats, and so on. You know, he writes about a man who's used by uh, another inmate to save a seat for them. That whenever he gets up from his preferred seat, he takes another inmate, shoves him in the seat, and they have to sit there until he comes back as a seat saver. So you get labor out of people by direct physical threat and coercion. But you also get it through economic exchange. And this is where he really starts spending a lot of his effort. 
looking at 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 money, uh, you know, as he says, is coin freedom. Is it one of the footnotes? It's coin freedom, and is highly valued. So money is really valued. Earning money inside is something that inmates do. There is money a uh, money supply circulating in a kind of black market way inside of the uh, of the institution. And so people engage in a surprising amount of activity, black market activity, in order to make money and to spend the money that they've made. Okay, so um, so they're going to trade in all kinds of stuff, in alcohol, in um, il- other illicit substances. Drugs are specifically mentioned. Uh, there's prostitution that takes place um, um, among the inmates, and apparently between the inmate and staff. But he really talks about inmate to inmate. Um, there's all kinds of things like there's banking services, loans with interest and so on that people have. Uh, there's barbering services, tailoring services, watch repair, shoe repair, um, courier services like taking and delivering things in town to friends and, 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 and relatives and so on. Um, car washing services uh, for the staff primarily, but it's a way to make money. You wash the staff people's cars. Uh, or visitors' cars, like visitors will come to visit an inmate, and the other inmates will wash their car for them while they're in there and get money that way. Shoe shining takes place, um, right? All kinds of things. So, so there, there's a trade in matches. So there's an economy that emerges here. Um, real money is used, but so are matches, and so are cigarettes. Cigarettes become a kind of token money, um, and then. Um, People engage in all kinds of little services, and the payment will be like one cigarette, that kind of thing. Gambling, there's a market for gambling and so on. And he argues that this this market, this economy, requires high levels of trust in order to function. You need an actual society to support a market uh, at this level. So social capital then uh, must be formed and must be, uh, um, you know, um, renewed over and over again in order for this to operate. He then writes about, you know, in addition to the economic exchanges, there's also social exchanges that take place. Um, So social exchanges are uh, basically a gift economy that emerges or a service economy of individual loyalty and individual service within the inmate population that kind of um, makes real, uh, you know, right, tangibly represents or tangibly feeds um, an ongoing relationship between between inmates. So gift exchange, service exchanges that take place not just for economic reasons, but in order to solidify or to honor a social relationship, uh, to create bonds of solidarity or to honor or respect or make real, visible bonds of solidarity. There's three kinds of these inmate-to-inmate relationships. There's buddy relationships, including a helper pattern, which he says is widespread. There are courting or sexual or romantic relationships, both hetero and and homosexual, um, to use his terms, uh, gay and straight. uh, um, And then, uh, um, sort of funny, like I've just been reading it, so you become 1960s here all at once. But at any rate, um, yeah, so gay and straight relationships and then then click relationships as well. So all kinds of like gangs and loyalty groups and so on that form. And that you, that all of these personal relationships uh, either require or are fed through tokens of exchange, um, you know, little ritual supplies. Uh, again, cigarettes are a huge part of this, money, other objects, little uh, drinks of alcohol, and so on. And he says that the cigarette lighting ceremony is everywhere. Lighting someone's cigarette off of another cigarette as a way to uh, signify something like um, regard for each other, uh, honor for each other, that kind of thing. So you can signify a relationship merely by lighting someone's cigarette or loaning them a match or loaning them a cigarette or engaging in some little act. Okay, so sustaining relationships requires energy and perseverance, especially romantic or sexual relationships. And he argues that is the intrigue, the uh, tension of organizing these things and pulling it off and getting a little bit of secondary honor from having been successful at pulling it off, right? that this is something that drives and sustains these relationships. Their very difficulty makes them kind of forbidden and hence makes them something that patients and inmates are willing to engage in. So all of this activity involves getting wise. So as newcomers, new inmates strip bare, get their new institutional clothing, wind up inside, the other inmates uh, begin to get them wise, share the tacit knowledge about how the inmate-to-inmate exchanges, culture and relationships formulate uh, the social control that's involved in it and so on. Page 27, he talks about pa- patron relationships, uh, mostly inmate-to-inmate as well as staff-to-inmate. He talks about staff-to-inmate relationships. Um, you know, there are feelings that emerge. There are 
Um, you know, some of these things are probably get the staff member fired, but 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 things that are less overt, but just you know, liking that people are people after all, and that some of the staff members are of low social class standing, whereas some of the inmates are high social class. So you get all kinds of um, again psychological premiums from like a lowly working class um, uh, staff person having a friendship with a relatively high class or high status inmate, right? Gives them a psychological premium. And it gives the inmate a, a chance to have a relationship with someone who's not another inmate, hence distancing themselves from the inmate role. All right, so page 302, intra-inmate social control is used to prevent collective loss of privileges. So the last thing that inmates want is for the underlife to collapse. They need it to survive. And so the inmate-to-inmate -inmate social control system is sometimes more severe than the staff-to-inmate social control system. As I mentioned in one of the first, I think the first recording here, any film about prisons will tell us, um, um, you know, there's always the scene or the threat of, of the shower rape or the prison rape or something like that, that the that the beatings, the bullings, the shanking, the the um, the rape and so on, sexual assault that goes on inside of total institutions, inmate to inmate is often the thing the inmates fear most, not the staff but the other inmates. And Goffman says that that in 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 his um, observation that this that this social control can be very powerful, and uh, and it's something that the inmates fear and that they'll uh, adhere to the system. Um, to avoid that. So again, you've got to, what you have here is a parallel, again, unauthorized society that is existing in the midst of an apparently formally organized, bureaucratically staffed institution, right? None of this secondary stuff, including the social control system, the punishments that are meted out inmate to inmate to keep them in line, none of this is authorized or even officially visible to um, the staff that runs the institution. It's not part of the primary adjustment, but nevertheless, it, um, it, it, it keeps it going, right? That hence it's a contained secondary adjustment. It's an underlife. Page 305, the underlife then generates behaviors that are not symptoms and should not be read as such. So it's one of the things he keeps emphasizing throughout this, that once you're inside a total institution, your behavior is conditioned by it. Behavior and action is structurally determined by the um, confines of the institution and by the vicissitudes or the specific pathways um, uh, that inmates have followed in building and, uh, you know, building out basically um, an underlife. So your life is determined by that and the actions that you engage in inside have as much to do or probably more to do with your need to form these inmate to inmate relationships and be a part of this underlife than it does with exhibiting symptoms that were present in civil society um, and so on. So the staff members had a tendency to identify uh, secondary adjustments as symptoms. And he keeps saying that that isn't it. And then not only are they not symptoms of mental illness, but they're actually some of the most important ways that the soul is preserved inside. And probably if anything therapeutic happens inside of these institutions where psychiatrists are almost never to be found and where actual individual therapy is rare, if anything like healing is going to take place, is probably taking place inmate to inmate. Again, if you see, uh, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, whatever happens inmate to inmate is certainly a more vivid life or a more, um, I guess, soul affirming um, round of action than whatever happens between the staff and the inmates, um, in, you know, in that book, play. Uh, or film. Okay, page 309, removal activities are really important. Finding some way to psychologically escape the confines of the institution, even if it's just in reverie or something like that, is really important. And again, that that's not to be taken as a symptom of mental illness. It's a necessity for someone who normally functions in civil society with a lot of privacy um, and, and, and isn't an inmate. You need to give removal um, um, activities to allow uh, for that escape. So that's not a symptom either. All right. Oh, yeah. And then finally, some actions and activities, some practices of, of the underlife are engaged in for the thrill, for action, right? Kills boredom and there's all kinds of, of, of fun attached to forbidden activities. And that some of it is like that, right? It, 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 it's, it's daring do and that kind of thing, all of which are qualities that aren't too bad to have on the outside. I want to end by sort of looking at the very last page of this essay where Goffman is sort of writing it is most uh, sort of poetic um, in the conclusion section. Um, 
so yeah so he's basically arguing arguing that um that again that this that these illicit um unauthorized activities that take place that are unplanned that take place outside of the view of the staff are really important for uh sustaining the self and maintaining the self and probably curing the self and he says without something to belong to we have no stable self and yet total commitment and attachment to any social unit implies a kind of selflessness right so you've got to belong somewhere but if you're in a total institution it becomes your only identity it kills off the self you become in durkheim's terms fully altruistic you you become selfless you don't have a self so our sense of being a self a person can come from being drawn into a wider social unit our sense of selfhood can arise through the little ways in which we resist the pull so uh so we're we become it so our sense of self or being a person we get drawn into a society but it's the way we push back is that determines our egoism our selfism our 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 individuality right so our status is backed by the solid buildings of the world like a total institution while our sense of personal identity often resides in the cracks right it's the way that we push back so the underlife provides a way to push back against the all-encompassing totality of the inmate social role in the inmate social identity it's a way for the existential self to survive inside of an institution that really doesn't care much about it right and that really cares more about just warehousing the self and managing a whole group of like 7000 inmates and doesn't really care very much about the you know cure of soul of any individual so the way that you push back against that by embracing the secondary roles and secondary uh actions in the underlife may very well be the way um that you uh sustain yourself on the way out so it's a very important book it's it's um um i uh, to me this is this is goffman at his best is this book and actually some of this writing and the underlife section is as good as it gets again when you go through it you'll know that there's many many references to um mid 20th century organizational theory reinhard bendix um melville dalton uh and others there's even a neat reference in there uh to Charles Warner's study of uh of drinking behavior in a dry Kansas town the study i think from the 1950s um i i went to got my phd from from uh university of kansas so it's a very famous study about an officially dry town officially dry county and then the way that everybody drank in town but while maintaining the facade of of being dry and so the way that that was maintained there was a real underlife a whole thing that trust that was involved and again smuggling operations that went on and all kinds of stuff to keep alcohol pouring in to the gullets right of um of people in this dry place. Okay, so the book of silence then is all about life inside of a total institution. Um for those who are in uh places like mental institutions or uh or prisons um or concentration camps or something when you get out there's probably a stigma attached to your identity as an inmate. And so the book stigma is really uh um helping people comprehend what it means to have what goffman calls a spoiled identity where your existential self has actually been altered in some way by um by process by the way that you've been processed through one of these total institutions and the way that you can you know keep it hidden or be out with it and then manage that in various ways and then the book you know most of his other books then really deal with the self in civil society and the way that you manage multiple uh, roles and so on All right, so there we are. So I recommend Stigma uh 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 highly and we will end our discussion of Goffman here um and then we'll move on into um um my my next series of lectures will be on uh, Foucault's discipline and punish more about prisons and uh camps and things and then we're going to end with uh um Hannah Arendt's um Origins of Totalitarianism. Okay. Hope this helps.